Before we get into tonight's message, I want to read something that came to mind in, in Matthew 12. You don't have to turn there, and it's not going to be on the screen. But it's in Matthew chapter 12, verse 20. And this is a, a prophecy referring to Jesus Christ. And it says, he, talking about Jesus, he will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. And going into the message tonight, there, there's a lot of us maybe that we, we feel like weak reads tonight. You know, 2020, maybe it's, it's been close to just breaking us. And if you are a, a, a weak read, I want to remind you tonight that you're not beyond repair. A, a weak read is not irreparable, and a flickering candle is not far too gone that it can't be reignited. There was a lot of times where we've come to Jesus where we've been weak reeds, where we've been like a, a flickering candle where our flame of passion and our flame of life for Jesus is, is about to go out. And, and my prayer for those of you here tonight that may feel like a weak reed or that you may feel like a flickering candle or those that are watching tonight, you may feel like a weak reed or that your flame's going out. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit of God would just... Blow on you tonight and reignite the flame that's deep within you. You know, the older I've gotten and the longer I've been in ministry, I'm realizing more and more that everybody you come across has a story. I mean, the person that you're sitting next to tonight has a story. We just sang about this is how I fight my battles. Everyone is facing some sort of battle. Some are big and some are small, but nonetheless, we're all going through life trying to do the very best we can, trying to be faithful to Jesus on our faith journey, but all of us are facing a battle nonetheless. Some, are of, some of us are facing battles that maybe nobody else knows about. But you're in an intense battle. You feel like a weak reed. You feel like a flickering flame. And tonight I'm going to continue with a series that Pastor Christopher began on a Sunday a couple of weeks ago. And I've been on Now What the last few Wednesdays. But I want, I want to go along with what he's doing on Sundays with this series called The Table. And tonight I've entitled this particular message, the king's table. The king's table. So if you have your Bibles tonight, I want you to turn with me to the Old Testament book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 4. And when you turn there, I want you to say, I'm there. And if you're not there, say, I'm trying. There you go. A lot of you are still trying. 2 Samuel is after the book of 1 Samuel. Second Samuel chapter 4. We're going to begin with verse 1. When Ishbosheth, Saul's son, heard about Abner's death at Hebron, he lost all courage and all Israel became paralyzed with fear. Now there were two brothers, Bana and Rechab, who were captains of Ishbosheth's raiding parties. They were sons of Remen, a member of the tribe of Benjamin who lived in Beeroth. The town of Beeroth is now part of Benjamin's territory because the original people of Beeroth fled to Gidim, where they still live as foreigners. Saul's son, Jonathan, had a son named Mephibosheth. And I'm going to be saying that name a lot tonight. So I'm going to try my best not to get tongue-tied. But he had a son by the name of Mephibosheth. Why don't you say that with me? Say Mephibosheth. <laughs> Mephibosheth, who is, listen to this, who was crippled as a child. He was five years old when the report came from Jezreel that Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle. Now listen to this. When the child's nurse heard the news, she picked him up. Talking of Mephibosheth. She picked him up and she fled 
But as she hurried away, listen to this, something happened. As she hurried away, something happened. She dropped him. She dropped Mephibosheth, and he became crippled. Tonight I want to talk to you a message I've entitled The King's Table. And there's a few points I want to make out of this story we read about, this account in 2 Samuel chapter 4. I want you to follow along with me. Number one, many of us have been dropped by people in our lives that we trusted the most. I'm going to minister to some hurting people tonight. I'm going to touch on some places in your heart that may have not been touched on in a while. I may, I may press on some, some tender spots, some, some wounds, some, some places where people may not have meddled in a while, but I think is super, super important. Like Mephibosheth, there's been many of us that have been dropped by people in our lives that we should have trusted the most. The Bible says that his nurse that was caring for him she dropped him. She dropped him. And he became crippled. Mephibosheth was dropped by someone who should have been trusted. Mephibosheth was dropped by someone who had been put in charge of his safety. He had been dropped by someone that should have been protecting him. I just wonder tonight how many people are in this sanctuary and how many people are watching online tonight that have been dropped by someone in your life that you trusted the most. Come on, sir. You were dropped by a family member. You, you were dropped by a parent. You, you were dropped by a coach. You're, you were dropped by a teacher. You were dropped by a mentor or a spiritual leader. You were dropped by a pastor. You were dropped by a close friend. You were dropped by a trusted coworker. You were dropped by a boss. You were dropped by a brother or sister in Christ. But nonetheless, someone that you trusted, someone that you thought was looking out for your best interest, someone that you thought was protecting you instead dropped you. And this is what happened to Mephibosheth at five years old. He had a nurse and rightly so fled when she heard of the death of Saul and Jonathan because she knew now that King Saul and Jonathan were out of the picture. She knew that David could do as, as any king could do and now would come after Saul's family and possibly do them harm. And his nurse obviously wasn't doing him harm intentionally. She was doing what a good nurse would do. And she picked up Mephibosheth at five years old and she fled to get away to protect him. And for whatever happened, the Bible doesn't give us details, but somehow or another, she dropped him. And sometimes even as parents and, and grandparents, we've dropped the ball. Maybe as friends, as, as pastors, as leaders, we've unintentionally dropped people. We've dropped the ball. We've let them go through the cracks at some point in their life. But sometimes there have been people that have been dropped intentionally. And maybe there are those of you in here tonight that, that you've been dropped intentionally by someone that you trusted. You were dropped intentionally by someone that you thought was going to look after you. You were dropped by someone intentionally that, that you loved and that you thought would protect you. You've been dropped by maybe an unfaithful spouse. You were dropped by a divorce. You were dropped by a betrayal. You were dropped uh, by a rape or sexually molested as a child people were careless in your life and as a result you were dropped man I can remember after my first daughter my oldest daughter Grayson was born how little she was and how fragile she was and realizing that wow that that God had entrusted this soul this tiny being this tiny soul into my care and for a moment there it, it was a bit scary 
Because I had this great burden and this great responsibility as a dad to care for her and to, to love her and protect her. And I remember just, just real easy, just, just holding her as careful as I could, watching her little fingers, watching her, her little legs and toes, being careful not to drop her. And I can remember leaving Glenwood Hospital in West Monroe and carefully putting her in that car seat and very slowly and very carefully pulling out of the parking lot, easing down Macmillan Road, headed south down Highway 34, just as carefully as I could because I, I wanted to protect that little child. I can remember my middle daughter. We had one of those, uh, what were they called, bumbo seats? Bumbo, do they still exist? Somebody like a bumbo. Adeline, she was so petite, like she couldn't fit in the bumbo. And there's some instructions on the bottom of the bumbo that says, don't put a child in the bumbo on an elevated space. And I guess we just overlooked those instructions. We put her in her bumbo in an elevated space and a counter in the kitchen. We walked away and we walked away. We heard a thud. Walked in the kitchen, there she is face first on, on that hard kitchen tile and, and you're walking over there and you're looking, you're checking her out, make sure she's not bleeding and, and bruised and, and thank goodness she came out okay and she was all right. You know, kids are tough. Kids are resilient and they do things that cause them injury sometimes and a lot of times if not most of the time they come away with maybe a scratch or or a bruise or or, or maybe a small cut but but what happens when things are much worse what happens when things happen that are permanent and, and maybe Mephibosheth the few for the first few years of his life maybe he had a time or two where he had fallen and he was able to get up and shake off the dust and everything was going to be okay and everything was fine. But, but this time, something was different. This time, he didn't get up. This time, he didn't remain the same. This time, when he was dropped, everything wasn't okay. This time, when he was dropped, something happened. Something was different. Maybe his feet began to, to turn inward and, and turn awkward, and maybe some bones were crushed, but this time, he didn't get up and move on as normal. Something happened in his life as a result of being dropped that would drastically change his life forever. This time when he was dropped, he became crippled. And that's the second thing I want to point out. Many of us have been crippled and damaged as a result of being dropped. The Bible says that the nurse took Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth, who was at that time five years old, and she fled, but she dropped him, and he became crippled. All of us have been through battles. This is how we fight our battles. We sing it by faith. We continue to fight. We continue to endure. We continue to press on. And all of us have been through great trials and great tribulations and great battles and great, and great testings of our faith through the years. And many times we may come out battered. Many times we may come out spiritually bruised. We may come out spiritually cut. But most of the time we move on. But sometimes things have happened in our lives where we've, we've been dropped so hard, where we've been dropped so heavy, we've been crippled as a result of being dropped. And many of us can look back a year ago or five years ago or 15 years ago. A lot of us can look back to our childhood and go back to a place where something happened, where someone we trusted dropped us, and it forever marked and changed our life. This time it crippled us. And we were never the same. You can point back to your childhood. You can point back to a time where you were bullied and made fun of and ridiculed in school. You can point back to a time where you were abandoned or rejected by a parent. You can point back to where you were raped or sexually assaulted. You can point back to where your character was assassinated or lies were told about you where things were said that damaged your reputation, but nonetheless, it was a moment that affected you forever. You can point back to a time in its clearest day that if it affected 
your entire life. And here's the thing, Mephibosheth, he was five years old. He was, he was a young boy, and this him being dropped and him being crippled was something that would affect the rest of his life. Look, let me tell you something. When you were young, when you're dropped and crippled as a child, many a times it affects we throughout the course of your entire life. That's why when you're counseling with people, you can go back and they'll tell you stories about something that happened uh, with this family member or that family member or this person or that person, and it's forever scarred them, forever marked them, all when it happened when they were a young child. They were crippled emotionally. They were, they were crippled or damaged mentally. It crippled them spiritually. It, it just point blank messed them up. Does anybody know what it's like? Am I speaking to anybody tonight that, that you know what it's like to have been dropped? And as a result of being dropped by someone's actions, you were crippled and your life has forever been changed. And, and look, this message tonight is not something to put fuel in your fire or make you feel like a victim. Some of you have been legitimately victimized, but it does not mean that you have the permission to live the rest of your life as a victim. But you can't bury your head in the sand and act like what happened to you never happened to you and never affected you because it did. And here was Mephibosheth. He was dropped. And as a result of him being dropped, he was crippled. He wasn't normal anymore. He didn't walk like everybody walked. He didn't walk like the other five-year-olds walked. He, didn't, he wasn't able to interact like all the other kids were able to interact. Why? Because he had been dropped. And as a result of him being dropped, his life was crippled not just physically but his life was crippled I want to continue with this story in, in 2nd Samuel chapter 9 I want you to turn just a few chapters over beginning in verse 1 it says one day David asked is, is anyone in Saul's family still alive now Saul was anointed the king of Israel Saul got sideways and the Spirit of God left him. And God rejected him as the king of Israel and said, I found a man after my own heart. Not a man after my own mind, but a man after my own heart. He'll do everything that I've asked him to do. And yes, David made some horrible mistakes that would come, but he's at the height uh, of, his, of his reign and the height of his throne right now. Is there anyone I can show kindness to in Saul's family? Is there anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness? Listen to this. For Jonathan's sake. He's telling us the reason why he wants to show kindness to the family of Saul. Why he wants to show kindness to the man that multiple times tried to kill him. I want to show kindness. If there's anyone still alive in the family of Saul, I want to show kindness to them. Why? For Jonathan's sake. Now, who's Jonathan? I don't know if you guys can flip over there real quick, but I want to I'll give you a little backstory in 1 Samuel chapter 18. Verse 1, if it's, on, if it's not on the screen, I'll read it. It says, after David had finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan. That's Saul's son. Listen, the king's son. There was immediate bond between them, Jonathan and David, for Jonathan loved David. From that day on, Saul kept David with him and wouldn't let, let him return home. And Jonathan made a solemn pact with David. In other words, Saul, uh, uh, Jonathan and David cut covenant. They made covenant because he loved him as he loved himself. Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off his robe and giving it to David together with his tunic, sword, bow, and belt. So if there is anyone left alive in the house of Saul, in the family of Saul, I want to show kindness to them. Why? For Jonathan's sake. Jonathan was my covenant partner, and I want to keep my word. I want to keep my promises to my friend. I want to remain faithful to my covenant. 
Verse 2, he says, he summoned a man named Ziba, or Ziba, who had been one of Saul's servant. Are you Ziba, the king asked. Yes, sir, I am, Ziba replied. The king then asked him, is anyone still alive from Saul's family? Now, you got to to understand, some of these people that were servants of Saul might be just a little bit nervous. I wonder if David's meddling, if David's trying to find out if there's still someone in the family of Saul that's still alive so David can go out and annihilate anybody that could be a potential threat to his throne. That's what a lot of kings would do when they took over thrones. They would go back and they would look over any former king's family to see if any of them was still alive, if anyone was still a threat to the throne. Why? So they could annihilate them and take them out. So Ziba might be just a little bit nervous as David's asking him these questions. Is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. Ziba replied, yes. See, Ziba had some, some, in for, some inside information because when Mephibosheth's nurse took him up, and fled when she heard the news of Saul and Jonathan's death. She, she fled to a particular place that we're going to read about here in just a second. But there was somebody that knew where he was. Somebody that knew where he was hiding out. Zib replied, yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. Listen to this again. He is crippled in both feet. Now, now why, not, why even bring that up? Right? There's, a, there's a lot of ways that you can describe people, but it's interesting that Ziba brings up Mephibosheth's disability. Yeah, yeah, king, there, there is someone still alive, but just, just so you would know, he, he's crippled in both feet. You ought to know, king, that he's not like everybody else. You ought to know, king, that he's not normal. You ought to know, king, that he's damaged and disabled. I just think you ought to know, King David, yeah, you may just want to let him be because a a, a crippled man may not look so good in, in the presence of the king. I just want you to know he's crippled. It's amazing how people tend to label other people. And he was pointing out his disability. He was pointing out his flaws. He was pointing out the fact that, yeah, there's a son that's still alive, but you need to know he's crippled in both feet. Verse 4, where is he? The king asked. He didn't say, how crippled is he? Uh, well, how, how messed up, how damaged is he? he? He's crippled in both feet. David said, go get him. Go, the King James Version says, go fetch him. It says, where is he? Listen to this. In Lodabar. He's in Lodabar, Ziba told him. At the home of Maker, son of Amiel. Listen to this. So David sent for him and brought him from Maker's home. His name was Mephibosheth. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. When he came to David, look, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. David said, greetings, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. Don't be afraid, David said. Very important. I intend to show kindness to you, listen, because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will listen to this. We're talking about, we're on a series called The Table. You will eat here with me where? Not just any table. We, we got a big, long table at our house. Jody and, and her daddy got on a project uh, when we first moved back, and I, and I think it could, it could probably seat 30 people. I don't know. All I know is me and Jimmy McLemore had to carry that thing in the house. It was heavy. But a table is a sign of, of, of hospitality. It's a great honor to be able to sit at the table of someone's house. Now, to be able to sit at the table of the king's house was even a greater honor. And David said, you will eat here 
with me at the king's table. Listen to this. Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth I'm told you I was going to have a trouble. Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, listen to this. Who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said, I've given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and servants are to farm, farm the land for him to produce food for your master's household. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will eat here at my table. Ziba had 15 sons and 25 servants. Ziba replied in verse 11, Yes, my lord, the king, I'm your servant, and I will do all that you have commanded. And from that time on, listen, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table like one of the king's own sons. From then on, all the members of Ziba's household were Mephibosheth's servants. In verse 13, And Mephibosheth, who was crippled in both feet, lived in Jerusalem and ate regularly at the king's table. Come on, how about an amen to that? Listen to me. Number three, many of us have allowed our disability to become our identity. Ziba replied in 2 Samuel verse 9, Chapter 9, verse 3, Ziba replied, yes, one of Jonathan's son is still alive. He's crippled in both feet. That was his identity. That was his label. This is a crippled boy. This is damaged good. And he carried that label and that identity his entire life. Second Samuel Chapter 9, verse 8, this is out of his own mouth. Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, Who is your servant that you should show such kindness? Look to, to how he refers to himself, to a dead dog like me. Now dogs in their days are different than dogs in our days. Dogs in our days we treat better than a lot of humans. I'm for real. I mean, they got organic dogs. Some dogs eat better than we do. Dog hotels, doggy hotels, doggy, a uh, doggy, all kind of things. But in that day, that wasn't the case. They were a nuisance. They were annoyance. That's why I said, "Why would you show such kindness?" And he refers to himself to a dead dog like me. You see, back in the day, having a disability or a sickness they believed, was a result of something you did wrong. It was the judgment of God. It was either something you did or something your parents or, or grandparents did. Remember Jesus when they came to him and said, hey, 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 Lord, this blind boy here, hey, was this a result of, of his sin or his parents' sin? They had their theology all wrong, and, and Jesus said, no, this was for the glory of God, that the glory of God might be revealed. So here was this young man who his identity, Mephibosheth literally means out of the mouth of shame. Who walked around in shame, who walked around labeled as a crippled, as damaged goods, as someone that wasn't like everybody else, someone that everybody just kind of wanted to, to stay away from. Some of you have allowed what has happened to you to define you. What happened to you may be a part of your story. It may have affected you in a major way, but it doesn't define who you are, and it certainly doesn't define whose you are. He's yeah. saying, David, do you know who I am? I, you say you want to show kindness to me. David, do you know who I am? Da David, do you, do, you, do, you not, do you see me? David, open your eyes, King. Can you see? I, I'm not like everybody else. I, I, I don't walk like everybody else. I'm, 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 I'm damaged goods. I'm a dead dog. I'm nobody. I'm a nobody. David, why would you call for me? I'm all washed up. Look, some of you, you've been labeled, and that label has stuck with you your entire life. Your, your, your disability has become your identity. As a man I greatly respected, I remember him telling the story as he grew up and was in grade school. 
he got in a lot of trouble. And I remember him telling the story of one day his teacher say, calling out his name in front of the whole class and said, you'll never amount to anything. You'll, you'll, you'll always be a nobody. And as a, as a young boy, that label stuck. And he took on that identity and he lived up to what was spoken over him and about him. Till one day he went to work for a gas company down in, in South Louisiana. He went and he took a test to apply for a job and manager called him in and he just expected him to tell him that he blew it. And he said, man, you, you've, you've way, you far surpassed you far surpassed the, the top grades on, 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 this, on this test. He said, if you really apply yourself, you know what? You, you really can become something in life. And he said, from that day forward, that curse was reversed and that curse was broken. Stop living up to what people have spoken over your life five years ago, 20 years ago when you've been a child. Stop it. Let that be reversed tonight. Number four, many of us have been living in our own post personal Lodabar. You notice, when David asks, is, is, is there someone from the family of Saul who's still alive so that I can show kindness to for the sake of, of Jonathan? And Ziba said, yeah, there's... One of Jonathan's son, he, he's crippled in both feet. Where is he, the king asked. And then he says, he, he's, in, he's in Lodabar. Now, Lodabar means no pasture. Literally means no pasture. It was a desert wasteland in the Philistine territory. It's a place of shame, a place of loneliness. And when the nurse picked up Mephibosheth, damaged and crippled after she dropped him, she fled to a place of refuge to keep him far away from any enemies that would come out to do him harm. And he lived in this place called Lodabar, which means no pasture. Remember in Psalm 23 where David said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pasture. Well, Lodabar was a place that literally meant no pasture and there's some of you that have been dropped and you've been damaged and you've been you've been crippled for so long you've been hurt so bad you've been living in your own personal lodabar your entire life you, you've been hurt so bad you you can't even write a book about it you you can't even talk about it you can't even bring it up. There's parts of your story that you've never shared with another human being. And I just wonder what was going through the mind of Mephibosheth that he was living out his life in no pasture land, in, in Lodabar. What was going through his mind through the years? If, if, if only this wouldn't have happened to me, I wouldn't be in Lodabar. I'd be in the palace I wouldn't be in the wasteland. I'd be eating like a king. If it wasn't for that nurse, if she wasn't have been so careless, if she wouldn't have dropped me, I'd have been there instead of here. And many of you have gone about through your life and because you have been dropped and you have been crippled, you're constantly asking yourself, if this wouldn't have happened here, I know I could have been here. I should have been, I could have been, I would have been this, but because this happened in my life so long ago, it crippled me and it jacked me up and I can't seem to heal. It's marked me forever. You've been living your life out in Lodabar. Just wonder if he ever thought to himself if it wasn't for that big bad old David, the king that grandpa talked about, I wouldn't be living here. I wonder why he, while he was living in Lodabar, if he ever felt forgotten. Have you ever been in a place where you just felt like you've been forgotten? I want to remind you tonight, no matter if you're in Lodabar, no matter if you're in a place where there's, where there's no pasture, I want to remind you tonight that God hasn't forgotten you. 
God knows what you've been through. God knows what's happened to you. God knows where you are. God knows what you're feeling. He knows what you're going through. And tonight, maybe somebody needs to know that God has not forgotten about you. And my prayer, like like, uh, them sending uh, Ziba after Mephibosheth, that you need to be reminded that, hey, God's calling you out of Lodabar tonight. Some of you need to, to get out of Lodabar. Pack up your stuff, pack up your bags, and get out. God's calling you. Hey, the king's calling for you, Mephibosheth. You don't have to live in Lodabar anymore. You don't have to live where there's no pasture. You don't have to live where there's no shame. You don't have to live in isolation. You don't have to live in loneliness because the king is calling you. Some of us need to hear that tonight. Number five, and Pastor Brad, if you would come. Just because you've been dropped and damaged doesn't mean you'll miss out on God's destiny for your life. To sit at the king's table. He's a boy that had been dropped. Wasn't his fault. There's a lot of situations we get ourselves in because of our own mistakes. This is something that happened. It wasn't his fault. He truly was a victim. He was dropped. He was crippled. He was damaged. And he lived out his place, his life in a place called Lodabar. But God hadn't forgotten him. God knew what he had been through. God knew exactly what he was going through. And just in God's sovereign time, you see, God God is a God of perfect timing. He, he might have promised something to you. Something might have been prophesied to you years and years ago. It takes time for that prophetic word to come to fruition. Just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean that it's not going to come about. It took over 13 years for Joseph to realize the dream that God gave him as a 17-year-old young man. And God hasn't forgotten about you. God knows what you've been through. God knows how it's damaged you. God knows what it's done to you. God knows how it's crippled you. But just because you've been dropped and damaged doesn't mean that you're going to miss out on God's destiny for your life. To sit at the king's table. And I love how it says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, Mephibosheth. I intend to show you kindness because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I cut covenant with Jonathan and although he's no longer here, I intend to to carry out my end of the deal. I I intend to, to fully carry out the promise I made to your daddy. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. Some of us are benefactors of something somebody else has done and who has gone before us. Some of you are here as a result, not of anything you've done, but as a result of your grandmother, your granddaddy, or your great-grandmother and granddaddy, or your mom and daddy who prayed faithfully their whole lives for you. I'm praying that my kids and my grandkids one day will be benefactors of of sacrifices their mom and daddy made for them. Things that we may not ever see come to fruition, but one day they'll be benefactors of a price that their mom and daddy or their grandmama and granddaddy made. And I'm going to show you kindness, John. I'm going to show you kindness, Mephibosheth, because of my promise to your father Jonathan I'm going to give you the property that once belonged to your grandfather Saul and you will eat here with me with me you'll eat here with me you're damaged but you're going to sit at the king's table you were dropped but you're going to sit at the king's table what what happened to you crippled you and might have marked you and messed you up but you're going to sit at the king's table 11 verse 11, yes, my Lord, the king, I'm your servant. I'll do all that you've commanded. And from that time on, Mephibosheth had ate, had Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table like one of the king's, so very important, like one of the king's own sons. 
Verse 13, Mephibosheth, who was crippled in both feet, lived in Jerusalem and ate regularly at the king's table. And he went from Lodabar to Jerusalem. It's time for some of us to move out of one place and go to the place that God's calling us. When you own land, when you own part of the promised land in Israel, you, you are a part of the people of God. And he moved from Lodabar to Jerusalem. And David says, look, 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 I know you don't deserve to be here, but I want to show you kindness for your father's sake. I, do, I know you didn't earn your place at this table, but I'm going to show you mercy and grace. I, I know you're damaged, but you're not done. I know you've been dropped, but you're not doomed. I know you've been labeled, but I'm changing all of that, Mephibosheth. You're going to eat regularly here with me. You're going to dine regularly here with me. You're going to experience intimacy here with me. You're going to fellowship and have communion here with me. I'm going to restore to you what you've lost. You're going to live here, but most importantly, I'm going to treat you as my own son, a son of the king. I'm talking about the king's table tonight. So what, is this, what does this have to do with the gospel? What does this have to do with the gospel? Let's take a closer look at David. David was a giant killer. David was a mighty warrior. Da David was a mighty, uh, a mighty worshiper. David crushed his enemies and the enemies of Saul. David was a man after God's own heart. David, he loved Saul and David was faithful to his king. David had Saul's best interests at heart. David could have killed Saul on many occasions, but he kept forgiving him. David wanted to show loyalty and love to Saul, but Saul just wouldn't seem to let him. Yeah, Saul, on the other hand, who was just the opposite of David, he's kind of like me and you. He, he had a knack for being sometimes a little rebellious and out of the will of God and wanting to, to do his own thing and this rebelliousness that occurred time and time again, caused him constant grief and constant sorrow. And Saul was afraid of David. This soon become, it became an obsession so much so that he tried to hunt David down. Many times he, he threw spears at David to try to pin him against the wall. Saul tries to make everyone in his family paranoid and afraid of David. I'm telling you, he's after my throne. Don't, don't get too close to David. He doesn't have our family's best interest at, at heart. Don't, don't get close to David or he'll kill you. And David, of course, was the exact opposite of what, what Saul makes him out to be. But his family may not have known much better than what Saul told him. Then you had Jonathan, saw a son obviously named Jonathan. We read earlier that he cut covenant. Literally, he was in covenant with David. The most sacred of covenants was blood covenants. He was in covenant with David. He was the exact opposite of his daddy, Saul. Although a member of the family of Saul, he really doesn't belong there. He, he, he has more of a heart like David. Jonathan was always trying to bring peace between his daddy, Saul, and his best friend, David. But it seemed the harder he tried, the angrier Saul became. And then we had Mephibosheth. Who was the son of Jonathan. Again, we read the story in 2 Samuel 4 where he learned the news of his dad and his grandfather being killed and fleeing. And the news wasn't just horrible just because he lost his daddy and his granddaddy, but it was terrifying because the fact is that there was now no one left to protect him from David, who he thought might have been out to get him. Surely David will carry out the punishment on the household of Saul. His nurse carries him. She drops him. He's crippled, and he takes Refuge in a place that we learned about called Lodabar. His two feet might have been a, a constant reminder of, of David being out to get him. 
And if David ever found him, surely, surely if David ever found him, he would kill him. However, there's something that Mephibosheth may not be aware of that he may not know that he was in covenant with David, not because of anything that he had done, but because of his father, Jonathan. David's reigning. In 2 Samuel 9, we learn that David asked about Saul's family and Ziba, one of Saul's servants, confided in David that Mephibosheth was out in Lodabar and he tells him, to go get him. Can you imagine what Mephibosheth must have felt like when he was out in Lodabar and he held, and he heard the, the sound of hooves coming? When he heard the sounds of chariots coming, what was he thinking? Surely he was thinking, I, I'm, I'm done with everything my granddaddy told me about, everything my granddaddy warned me about, everything my granddaddy might have told me uh, about David is about to come to pass. My time surely is about to end. Instead, David does the exact opposite. I want to show you kindness because of my covenant with your father. And Mephibosheth, maybe he can't believe his, his ear. Do, 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 do what? Do what? I, I want to show you Kindness. Mephibosheth might have said, do you know who I am? Do you, do you know what I've heard about you? Maybe he said, do you know what I've said about you? What I've thought about you? Show me kindness. David was like, it's not about you. You can serve me a thousand years, Mephibosheth, and you'll, you would never earn a place at my table. Maybe he lifted out his hands and said, you see the scars. David might have said, you see the scars on my hand. Those scars are a reminder that I cut covenant. I entered into a blood covenant with your father, Jonathan. And here are my terms, Mephibosheth. I will restore you and I will restore all the land of your grandfather's. Mephibosheth, I will bless you. I'll forgive you. My house is your house, and you will live here in the palace with me. I'll be your father, and I will adopt you as my son. And David's like God wanting to bless us and, and, and restore us and show his kindness to us that leads to repentance. But instead, we're like Saul, rebellious and wanting to do our own thing. And Jonathan is like Jesus trying to reconcile Saul and David. And we're like Mephibosheth tonight where we have to make a choice. Where we've been damaged not just because someone dropped us, we've been damaged spiritually because of a disease that we all had called sin. Where we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Where we've all been like sheep and gone astray. Where we've all been rebellious and done our own thing. But the king saying, hey, come out of Lodabar. Come out. There's a place for you. There's a place for you. Damaged and all bruised and all, crippled and all, battered and all. I'm calling you. There's a place for you at the king's table. And the choice is yours whether or not you're going to enter into this covenant with me or not. See, the king's calling all of us to his table. And what a privilege and honor it is to sit at a place that none of us deserve. I want you to know tonight, regardless of your past, regardless of what you've done, regardless of what your shame, regardless of your deepest, darkest secrets that nobody else knows about, there's a place for you at the king's table. He's wanting to show you kindness. He's wanting to shower his love and his mercy on you tonight. And all we have to do is realize and recognize and take ownership in the fact that we're sinners in need of a Savior and willing to repent of our sins and repent of our old lifestyle and put our faith in Jesus Christ, the only one that can save us from our past and from our sins and from ourselves, the only one that has the power to invite us to sit at a place that none of us deserve. It's called the mercy and the grace of God. You see, this story is about the grace of God. It's about the mercy of God.